And joining us now for the full hour on the debate in Austin, Texas, Simone Brown. She is a professor of sociology at the University of Texas, Austin. And here in studio, Jordan Peterson, clinical psychologist and professor of psychology at the University of Toronto. Peter Timmerman, professor with the Faculty of Environmental Studies at York University. Jeff Pavier, entertainment columnist with the Toronto Star. And Michael Corrin, host of, I love this word, the eponymously named program on CTS and the author of As I See It. Good to have everybody around the table here in Toronto. And uh, Simone, we can say hello from your old hometown. You're from here, even though you're down there. Nice to have you on the program tonight. We're all gathered here, of course, because the Academy Awards are this weekend. Many people, won't say everybody, but many people are expecting big things for Avatar at the Academy Awards. And a lot of the issues raised in the movie have prompted a bit of a firestorm of controversy and discussion on a range of issues. So we're going to get into all of that tonight. But before we go to the sort of conversation up here, Sorry, Jeff, not to suggest that film criticism is down here, but let's no, just talk about this. It may well be these days, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's just talk about this as a movie. This is the number one movie of all time, right? Two and a half billion in sales right now. Why do you think the film, as a film, is so successful? Well, I think it's largely because of the 3D technology. Um, I think that uh, if there is one thing that we can not argue in terms of Avatar's uh, demonstrable achievement, it is that it has kicked in a new era of movie technology and I think also expectations for the kind of entertainment technologically that movies will uh, or need to provide for people in the future. This is it, 3D has come, Avatar has brought it. Apart from that, it ain't much of a movie. <laughs> okay, Simone, get off the fence and tell me what you really <laughs> think, okay? <laughs> Simone, why do you think the, hit, the picture was such a hit? Well, I, ha I think I have to echo Jeff here. It was just the technology was meant to be spectacular, this 3D technology, but a kind of one-dimensional story, and um, I think it was just something new that the public wanted to see. Michael, do you Lots like of it? Hype. I thought it was the finest uh, piece of work ever. No, it was rubbish. It, it was, it was um, <laughs> and I, I don't say this as, as the cynic who has to say that popular work is not entertaining. I, I love Star Wars, The Innocence of It. Um, X-Men, I thought, was a beautifully made movie. I went there with my family, my, uh, with a 12-year-old. I wanted to like this thing. I love the 3D stuff. It, it, it was putrid. It was badly acted. Um, it was uh, derivative. It was hackneyed. It was cliched. I was bored after about an hour and a half. And I, I wish I could say otherwise. I thought it was dreadful. Mm -hmm. Was I surprised the man who gave us Titanic and the Jesus tomb? No, I wasn't surprised at all, really. <laughs> OK, Jordan? Well, I thought it was beautiful. And I think part of the reason it was popular, apart from its specific technological appeal, was that it also appealed to people because of the idea of the avatar, of course, because you're an avatar in a video game and it's an impressive modern idea. So I think he hit the, you know, the interest of the public right on the button. Peter. I think it was an act of eco-cultural deforestation. I think it, <laughs> it, 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 it bulldozed its way through mythology, film, the environment. I thought it was a catastrophe as a film and I'm a devout environmentalist. I thought it was a, a travesty and, and uh, I'm just I'm just shocked that so many people are taking it to their bosoms. This is a book about Avatar. Um, taking it to their bosoms as if somehow it's the great story about the environment and nature. Uh, it's, uh, I'm just very depressed about the I've whole I've changed enterprise. my mind. I think it was a great movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. support around well, the table okay. tonight. I'm, I'm no. glad, to, glad to see so much love and support for this motion picture. And uh, I can't imagine there's any, well, I'm sure there are a few people out there who haven't seen it. And if you haven't seen it, it is a beautiful movie. And here's a bit of what it looks like. Roll tape, please. Ladies and gentlemen, you are not in Kansas anymore. You are on Pandora. You should see your faces. We have an indigenous population called the Navi. They are very hard to kill. This is why we're here. Because this little gray rock sells for 20 million a kilo. Their village happens to be resting on the richest deposit, and they need to relocate. Those savages are threatening our whole operation. We're on the brink of war, and you're supposed to be finding a diplomatic solution. That's the trailer from Avatar. Uh, Jordan, you study the psychology of myths, and I'd like to know what established myths you see in this motion picture. Well, myths have a pretty standard structure, and one of the standard representations in myth is nature, and nature can be represented sort of positively, like it was in the Avatar or it can be represented as something to conquer, justly conquer, like it is in most Westerns. So that's the heroic individual moving wonderful culture into the despoiled wilderness. 
Well, this movie has exactly the opposite structure of that. So nature is put forward as something that's pristine and perfect, and technology and culture is portrayed as rapacious. So it's like, it's, a, it's an anti-Western. That's one way of looking at it. Okay, Peter, your expertise is environmental studies, and many people have observed that this is an environmentalist film. What do you say to that? Well, for a start, the ecology of the planet makes no sense. I mean, you have a huge glass planet next door to it, so presumably the gravity would destroy everything on the planet. <laughs> when you actually read, there's a book about this, it has all the biology and ecology in it. The planet is supposed to be a planet with m more nitrogen and oxygen. Well, if there's more oxygen, the planet would catch fire. There are, so you're saying it, the science isn't perfect on this? Well, actually, the interesting thing Movie. is that they got all these people. They got an exobiologist, they got an astrobiologist, they got a woman, an ethnomusicologist, and, and they created this book which has actually all these plants and all these things. So it actually could have been a very rich ecological movie, instead of which it's a, it's a I mean, there's more real sort of ecological substance in Pocahontas <laughs> or in the film that I'm fond of, which is Fern Gully, which is a, a film which actually has an ecosystem of fairies involved in it. I mean, I think the, the mm -hmm. film, the, the, the environmental quality of the film, it, it, the, the, the real sort of deep message of the film, which is what I'm most offended by, is not the struggle over large bulldozers and the rest of it, which I'm, you know, I'm in favor of struggling against large bulldozers, but the fundamental deep metaphor of the film is that you can plug directly into nature the way you plug directly into the internet. The, the unobtainium, which is the, the, the uh, what, That's what, the rock. What, what I used to call ups, upsidasium in Bullwinkle cartoons, it was called upsidasium. <laughs> it's now called unobtainium. Uh, the, one of the few witty things in the actual film uh, is that this unobtainium is a superconductor. And the superconductor is going to help people connect. And so one of the things that's going on in this film, I call it hypernature. What's going on in this film is, is, is part of the pathological situation we find ourselves in, where people are so disjointed and so disconnected from nature that they actually have to go into a movie theater in order to get an experience of nature, okay. which, is a, which is a sort of travesty of what an actual jungle, how a jungle functions and how the natural okay. world functions. But these criticisms that you have, Jeff, do th does it fail as a movie because of these criticisms that Peter's identified? No, uh, but I think that what Peter is doing is he's zeroing in on the important next level of distraction from the fact that it is a terrible movie. I think a lot of this discussion about the environmentalism of Avatar, uh, whether or not it is racist, all of that kind of stuff, basically distracts from the fact that it is as Michael pointed out, it's not that it's a popular entertainment that makes it so awful. It's the fact that it's awful that makes it so <laughs> awful. Yes. It yes. is a script written by a man for whom no one is able to say, Jim, maybe we ought to work on this a little bit more. So we can talk <laughs> yeah. about the, uh, uh, the technology, we can talk about the issues, we can talk about the Oscars, but the fact is, at the core, it is one of yeah. the most inept scripts ever to become this popular. I thought he spent 14 years on this. That's what he's claiming. He, oh, he claims. claims that he spent 14 years. This is like years. a latter George Lucas, when mm -hmm. people couldn't say to him, George, this is rubbish, this is really bad, you've got to do this again because of his early success, and thus the latter Star Wars movies are very poor. Uh, Tolkien, if we want to talk about environmentalism, mythology, and, and, and good against evil, I read a book about Tolkien. doesn't make me an expert, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I can pretend to be one. Uh, if you look even at the Tolkien movies, the Lord of the Rings movies, there was far more complexity, subtlety, the acting was, was far superior, the script was, was quite beautifully written, and I thought it was more beautiful. I didn't even find this a very beautiful movie after the initial 15 minutes. I was used to what I was seeing, and I found it very repetitive. Mm -hmm. Simone, how should we interpret the mystical and pure connection that the Navi seem to have with nature? Well, I think... Um one of the things I want to talk about with the film and how we can interpret what's happening is how it's being taken up around questions of environmentalism. So is it that we can um, see people that are you know, having their, their spaces destroyed and, and in the pursuit of profit or raw goods or materials, can it get us in the real world and not in the avatar world to ask questions about these things, about our own complicity in environmental destruction? And I think maybe you know, just the idea that the, when you left the movie theater, you recycled your glasses. Maybe that's the only thing that Avatar will, will allow us in terms of environmental <laughs> impact. <laughs> that was good. I mean, I think one of, the, one of the issues that maybe Simone can talk about is, is how racist the film is. I mean, well, hold off on there. We're not going to go there yet, because we, mm. we're going we're to take the criticisms in order here. The first oh, thing we're going to get... Oh, yeah, I've got a list here, Peter. Right. Stick with me here. But those things aren't delinked, you know. No. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's very, okay. very true, but we'll get to that. But yeah, we're going to get to that. Simone, let me stick with you, because, of course, one of the things that this, that this picture has done, 
allegedly, according to some, is that it has portrayed uh, the people who seem to be American-like soldiers in a very negative way, and that hasn't happened a lot in, mm -hmm. in motion pictures lately. Now, you're a Canadian living in the United States. How are mm -hmm. Americans responding to this sort of anti-American, anti-military um, theme that runs through the picture? Well, I think because they, we had in this film the Jake Sully character, yeah. the um, ex-Marine, I think it allowed a kind of forgiveness for that character, the kind of um, Blackwater, uh, the character with the scar, the, co the, the colonel who was really the bad guy and the real meanie in the movie. So I think that, um, you know, it was, it's kind of give and take, but there was a negative portrayal, but it kind of, the film itself allowed a, a, a rebirth of this particular um, character in a sense, and I think masculinity and whiteness in general. So I think there's a lot of forgiveness there. Yeah. I don't think that it, we necessarily would see that as a, as a poor reflection of America. And, and of course, the bad guy is, and I think this is quite significant, a southerner. And if you look at the history mm -hmm. and ask any Southern actors what roles are they offered, it's generally a Confederate soldier, a Klansman, or some sort of lunatic. Um, and the caricature of that man, and of course, he pushes weights as well, which means he must be evil. And then the other bad guy mm. eats throughout the movie. Now, that's very bad directing. When, when you have a character who's eating constantly to show they just don't care about <laughs> other people. Uh, the Australian playing the American who was the good guy who, in the end, did rescue them, that meant Americans mm. are generally, in the end, okay. Well, I wanted mm. to go even mm. further, Jordan, and, and ask you whether you think that this movie, in fact, is an indictment on all of Western-style civilization. Mm. Want to go that far? Well, it's a piece of propaganda, fundamentally. And I said it had a mythological structure. But what it really does is that it, it parasitizes mythological power to give it whatever power it has. And the reason it's propaganda is because it presents things ter in a terribly one-sided manner. So nature is perfect culture and the military is absolutely evil. It's like, well, no, nature isn't perfect. I mean, nature is cancer and parasites and freezing to death and, and plague-carrying mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. And yeah, nature is, you know, red in tooth and claw. And uh, culture, well, you know, you got to think that Cameron's movie was a technological masterpiece because he's a great admirer of technology, except that he seems mm -hmm. to have absolutely no gratitude to technology. It's kind of like gore in that regard, I think. And uh, so it's propaganda partly because it's one-sided and partly because it's ungrateful. Jeff, is it an indictment of Western <coughs> civilization? Yeah, well, maybe it is, but uh, if, if it is, it's a very, very safe indictment. I mean, the other thing about Avatar is that Avatar is a movie that, apart from the technology, is really taking no risks whatsoever, right? Yeah. If it were taking risks, then it would be more direct in whatever it's trying to say about the American military. Like, I don't even know, are they, is, is it now an American planet? Do they, does this represent the entire planet? Like, that kind of stuff mm -hmm. isn't even dealt with. Mm -hmm. And if he really wanted to deal with racism and environment, he'd deal with a real environment and he did with a real race if he was really interested in doing that and I don't think he is I think that the, the, the this this depiction of the uh, 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 the, the rapacious uh, corporate uh, militaristic stuff it's it's completely safe these are easy villains mm -hmm. these are easy heroes mm -hmm. these are easy subjects you saw district 9 obviously that Absolutely. was a lot more shades far of more gray. interesting yeah, far yeah, more yeah. interesting uh, Hurt Locker another major nominee, uh, incredibly more you know infinitely more interesting movie than this one mm -hmm. I want to read something from the National Post here. David Boas wrote this from the Cato Institute, and uh, the National Post published it uh, a couple of months ago. Conservatives see Avatar as anti-American, anti-military, and anti-corporate or anti-capitalist, but they're just reacting to the leftist ethos of the film. They fail to see what's really happening. People have traveled to Pandora to take something that belongs to the Navi, their land and their minerals under it. That's a stark violation of property rights, the foundation of the free market, and indeed of civilization. Sure, the Navi probably view the land as their collective property. At least for human beings, private property rights are a much better way to secure pro property and prosperity. Nevertheless, it's pretty clear that the land belongs to the Navi, not the sky people. Now, that's a story conservatives ought to be able to understand. Now, you say, oi, 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 but I'm going to ask you whether you think conservatives ought to be rallying behind this picture, given that message. Yeah, I did see the invisible hand of the market throughout the movie. <laughs> Absolutely. And, uh, you know, Adam Smith, that little, that yeah. little uh, drop in role. Yeah. This guy has too much time on his hands. <laughs> uh, Hollywood is anti-conservative. It's the set position. It doesn't matter very much. There are messages that can be read in many Hollywood movies. Just enjoy them as movies. It, it, it's so uh, clumsy and flimsy. To even use such an analysis is pointless. I don't really care what the message is, particularly if it is a good movie, if it's a fun movie. Uh, the messages from it? Look, 
full of irony, full of paradox, full of contradictions, and, he, and I don't think Cameron would even know what they were. Uh, you're watching with, with uh, 3D glasses, all of this advanced technology, so you can admire people who despise technology. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, 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 the natives exactly. cannot save themselves. It takes a white man to say, let's do it this way. We're going to get to that. Okay, we're going to that. get to that. So, remember, this is Titanic. Titanic was a, the Titanic was built um, in a dockyard where Roman Catholics were not allowed to work. If they turned up for work, white hot bolts of this size were thrown at them. Um, the whole nature of British imperialism, what the Titanic... Rip the movie is all the working class people are hugging and dancing, whatever their ethnic background. It was just like that, Steve. Yeah, the James Cameron time. picture. And, and yeah. on deck, it's all, I say, you're a swine, I think I'll stab you in the back. Cliches and caricatures, whether they're on board a large ship that's going to sink, or whether they're on this planet, I think it's the same Cameron. I think the mm -hmm. expression is, he's laughing all the way to the box office, though. Yeah, I wish I was his friend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Jordan, you wanted to say. Um, no, I can't remember what I was going to say. <laughs> okay, so well, let me pick up on that. Uh, let, let me go to the woman who is sitting in a little tiny blue patch of the biggest red state in the United States and ask her whether that conservative message, as enunciated by the uh, fellow from the Cato Institute, is resonating at all down there. I mean, it could, but some people will rally around a tea bag if they could. I think, um, <laughs> you know, some of them. I think they're doing that, aren't that, they? That, yeah, I think so. <laughs> But, um, you know, the, the film, I think it, it, it does allow us to think about a lot about Western culture. And one of the elements that really struck me was the character of Jake Sully, who um, was, went there to get his legs back because he couldn't have access to health care. You know, and I think that's something that could resonate with the, with the conservatives. And, but it also lets us think about the idea that only certain bodies can live a full human existence or a full Navi existence and that you have to be able-bodied. So if it, could, if it can get us to question, I mean, this, this falseness around able-bodiedness and, and, and movement and being human, I think it's a good thing. Okay, Peter, let me try this with you. Some critics have argued that the lifestyle that the, Nav the Navi demonstrate in this movie is right. far too beautiful, far too harmonious, far too lovely for a culture that is supposed to be really primitive. And the question, I guess, is would we really feel this kind of sympathy uh, and empathy for the Navi if we saw their daily life as being really as primitive as primitive is normally? Uh, yeah, I, I well, I... I I don't understand why there are, apart from having wanted to get FaceTime because of this movie, why um, there are indigenous groups that have signed up um, in, you know, putting ads about protest um, um, about this, uh, about the film. And the film, and I'm just echoing Michael, the film depicts these people as if they haven't figured out that bows and arrows don't work against helicopters, and they need a white marine to tell them and to rally them together. I mean, this is such a cliche from, from colonial film for films over the last, I don't know, 15, 20 years. Pocahontas and all these film dances with wolves. You know, you've got to wait for the white guy to come along. I mean, I they're not, they're, they're sophisticated. The, in, in the book, I keep referring to this book. This is a book about an activist survival guide about this. But in the book, there's a whole tradition that the Navi have. They have, they have songs, they have music, they have a whole culture and so on. None of which shows up in, in, in the movie. What shows up in the movie, their whole sort of cultural apparatus, is what I refer to as the road to, road to Zanzibar scene. Where they where they sway backwards and forwards in front of oh, the yeah. in front of this vast tree, and it's straight out of those movies, MGM in the 1950s, where they'd say, "What we need now is we need uh, we need an African dance scene. Can we have an African dance scene?" And they do this kind of s swaying thing, and that's the really powerful cultural moment. By the way, in it's, the what, film. it's what CBC TV does whenever they want to depict native people now, some sort of drumming and chanting. Swaying. So let's not pretend we've gone past the 1950s. Not all of us have. Okay, Jordan. Part of it is. There's a noble savage idea underneath it that goes along with the idea yeah. that the, the planet is paradise. So, you know, there, there was an old European idea and that any culture that was unspoiled by civilization, and this is a Rousseauian idea, was going to be natural and pure. And that's exactly what you see here. And the truth of the matter is, is that among most smaller tribal human organizations, the rate of male-on-male -male homicide, for example, is spectacularly high. So they tend to be relatively brutal interpersonally. So, but it's part of the mythology. If you're living in paradise, and Pandora, by the way, is a very weird name for paradise, right? Because mm -hmm. Pandora, is, yeah. Pandora yeah. is the box out of which all the trouble comes. Correct. Which is the missing part of Mother Nature in the movie. Are we mm -hmm. going to discuss gender? Is that on your list? Oh, and I wanted to say something about the hero, <laughs> too. <laughs> Sully isn't the hero. His girlfriend's the hero, and really, because 
Sully I mean, is the this... idea that we don't know her name is that the just shows really about. Well, that has more to do no. about with my memory than the movie. But she <laughs> purifies him, eh? Because he's a mili he's a crippled military character, and she purifies him with her soul, and her soul is a representation of the purity of nature. So it isn't that he's there to save them; it's that she saves him, mm. and then because of the transformation that she represents because she's nature too, then he can be on the right side. I think to Simone's point, her name's Natiri. Aha, uh -huh, Natiri. Oh, wow. So Natiri big. becomes the vessel through which he can uh, c transform. And I think that's, sure. that's good, but could we, I think one of the questions to ask is could the film have been made without the Jake Sully character? Could Natiri have done her own saving of her people on her own without this character? And I don't necessarily think that that film ever would have been made. I don't think it would have been conceived by James Cameron. I don't think so at all. No, I don't yeah, think so. I don't because think so. why? Because the notion of a female... No, because I think that the, you know, and I, I, would, I, would, I would bet that that book that Peter's been showing us, which provides the background, was probably written in a panic after the movie was oh, released, yeah. saying, we got to fill this stuff mm. in, we're going to get asked questions. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, Cameron put a whole team of people to write in a sort of a back history. I'm just, what I'm talking about is that, I mean, all of this is basically, you know, I, I when you know, when Peter was describing movies in the 1950s, I was, of course, also thinking of the, the, the requisite volcano sacrifice that used to take yeah. place in all of those <laughs> movies, oh, yeah. right? This movie is just like one basically scene short of a volcano sacrifice. <laughs> <laughs> and I, we are all, when we talk around this, we're talking around that big hole, which is the hole in the script. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the reason why one is able to project as ridiculous an argument as the one that you read to us, with all due respect earlier, Steve, is the, the fact the Cato that, Institute. Yeah, exactly, mm -hmm. is that it's a blank screen of a movie. Yeah. It leaves, yeah. it, it's, there's, mm -hmm. it's, it's sucking all of this debate into it because there is nothing there. It's well, Rashomon. Yeah. You can put whatever you want there. Well, and when, yeah. when, when one of the problems is, is that if, if you suppose you actually want to make a film that's got a serious ecological myth in it, yeah, like yeah. ones that we've talked about? The problem with the James Cameron case is that in a, in, in a whole range of his films, he has this he he has to descend in his own personal pathology. Yeah. Yeah. His own personal pathology is, <laughs> is is a mother and child that need protecting from uh, an invasive father with a large machine gun. Yeah. And and and, wow. and, and that's of course it's over and over again in all in mm -hmm. these films. And and the only way that the father with the large machine gun can be stopped is by a woman picking up a machine gun and starting to smoke like Sigourney Weaver in the yeah. film. I mean, this is what constitutes mm. His version of, of strong female golly, is golly. with guns and, 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 and they smoke cigarettes. So you have a yeah. botanist in this film who knows nothing as far as I can tell about botany. She looks into microscopes. And, we and, haven't talked and about the smoking, actually. Anybody smoke here on this group? No. Anybody smoke? No. But it's a no, signal. Not, it's, no. it, it's a signal that, that well, Sigourney Weaver is tough, you see, because in Aliens it, she's it's tough. It's 200 years in the future, future, isn't it? Yeah, so 2150 it's still, it takes still place. smoking cigarettes 200 years in the future. Well, she does if anyway. If they're tough. If they're tough. Wait, what was, the, was it <laughs> Apocalypto, the Mel Gibson movie? Um, was Mad that Max? Called? No, no, no. Apocalypto was, uh, yeah. was that the, yeah. which, Apocalypto which I right thought now. was actually quite effective and, and largely successful, and, uh -huh. and covered these sort of issues, but uh, with a greater deal of, of, of reality. It showed both good and bad in any culture as they would be. There was a, a moment of pathos at the end, and. And of course, Gibson has to be hated. As well as a pathological Gibson. creator behind it, yes, right. <laughs> uh, possibly so, <laughs> but another, another pathological. One with yeah, more, yeah. far more talent than yes. Mr. Cameron, I would argue. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. But Do the last hour and a half of the film is really James Cameron working through this. But that's why it all turns into guns and people um, killing each other on a large scale. And, and men with large, you know, these machines, they've got to put in themselves in these big machines. Do you know this for a fact about Mr. Cameron, <laughs> or are you just uh, construing <laughs> this? Just, <laughs> as a, there's a professor of psychology sitting opposite me, so I have to be well, careful. Well, he must be right. <laughs> well, but it's, but it, you can see this over and over again in his films. There's, the, there's a mother and child together, and then there's this invasive father who comes in with a large gun, well, let me and, they have to, and they have to stop it. Let me come at it, Jeff, uh, from, from the other side, which is you, you pointed out a few minutes ago that there are all sorts of ellipses in this yeah, thing. There's, yeah. you know, we've, all sorts of backstory that we don't have. Yeah. Do you think we would have felt, this is sort of a, admittedly speculation here, would we have felt more compassion for the earthlings, for lack of a better name for them, if it was explained somewhere in the movie why they were mining for this, whatever it's called, unobtainium or whatever? Well, I think it's, I mean, I, it, would, it would certainly make the film just a, a little bit more complex, mm -hmm. right? It would, and, and I think that probably, you know, in my old age, what I'm looking for is a movie, no, no from, what I'm looking for from a movie is no longer pure sensation, believe it or not. I'm actually looking for something that my mind can engage with, and I want to be taken on a journey that can be as old-fashioned as tr and traditional as the development of a character. And I, one thing that I find interesting about this movie is that if you just respond to the movie's rhythms, if you just respond to it as a visceral experience, is it not interesting how it kind of lurches alive only when it's destroying this planet it claims to love? Mm, yeah. The movie's real heat 
all the money shots, everything are contained in the destruction of this environment after we have spent yeah. two hours celebrating it. And I just say that that's something that's, that is very much, I think, uh, an interesting part of this film. Is that I think there's an internal contradiction at work. Sorry, let me follow uh, up with Simone on that because I, did, did you see this movie in a theater with other people or was it a private screening or how'd you see it? No, with other people, yeah. With other people. Was there a... Was there any discomfort in the American movie theater in which you saw this at what appeared to be the violence um, directed towards the American soldiers uh, towards the end of the picture? Any discomfort with not, that? Not that I noticed. No, not that I noticed. I think we're just so accustomed to violence and seeing real war on television. So um, I don't think there was really any discomfort. Maybe just some boredom. You know, I was waiting for <laughs> uh, Jason Bourne to show up and actually do something. <laughs> but. but Matt was busy somewhere else. Okay. You wanted it's to yeah, see it? Yeah, yeah. So I don't, I don't think so. It's useful to think at least to some degree about why the movie was so popular. You know, so we talked about the reasons of technology and people are sophisticated enough to be looking for cutting edge technology and they like the visuals but it is definitely the case that he taps into appropriate mythological themes you know mm -hmm. and I don't think the movie is that far off Star Wars in that in that aspect mm -hmm. I mean the the natural paradise for example that Natira is part of is presented as a kind of collective harmony you know there's kind of there's a deep idea in the idea of collective harmony because if you come to a good agreement with people Everyone in the agreement is happy with the agreement. And those, thing, those sorts of things tend to be stable. And so what Cameron is pointing to to some degree is that Utopia, which would be Paradise, which is this movie, mm -hmm. is composed of a state where everything is put together in harmonious balance. And there's something about that that's true, and that's partly why the movie has power. And like, there are themes in it that drive it. The problem with it is it's too one-sided. You know, and my son said something interesting about the movie. He's a teenager, and so I think he's more like the target audience. But he said, and I don't know if this is appropriate or not, but that it was a technological showpiece, and do you really want to clutter that up with a complex plot and complicated <laughs> characters? Because the, the point was the technological showpiece, and mm -hmm. it had a basic story which had an appropriate mm -hmm. mythological theme, despite its, you know, appalling simplicity. But I, I think Cameron, though, I, I don't think Cameron set out to, to put in very simplistic facile characters. I think he, he assumed he was providing us with something fairly complex. Mm -hmm. Look, um, this hand-me-down pantheism, uh, but no, I don't want to be uh, too uh, profound about this, it's just a silly movie, but hand-me-down pantheism, people are moving, well, some people are moving away from what they think is organized religion. Uh, the, the rather gullible, with all due respect, I don't mean you, but the acceptance of anything that is associated with climate change and global warming, the movie plays into that. We have a very dumbed-down, numbed-down culture. Oprah has uh, the final answer on most things. We shouldn't really be surprised if the movie is so successful. Beautiful, unchallenging, confirms our stereotypes anyway, uh, brings in the environment, and isn't, and isn't God a bad thing, and religion's really very nasty. Um, there it's all was. there. A great movie? Yeah. Okay, let's... Uh, if I was a pagan, I would be offended by the film. I uh, think I think the the way in which it deals well, but the way in which the way in which it deals with um, with the uh, sacred spirituality in by native trains yeah. is, is is absurd. You know, yeah. worshiping of the one great tree. I mean, okay, th there were druids once, but you know, all the pagan religions that I have any knowledge of and knowledge are extremely sophisticated, very complex, and are are um, you know saturated in very in, in very religion. specific. Daily rituals. Okay, this Peter, is a, this is a movie version of it. This this uh, pagan is not a pagan, but he wants to move the discussion. And, and I guess I'm going to pull a line from Clint Eastwood here and say I'm going to go ahead and make your day. We're going to get to the racism angle, which I know you all want to talk about. And now I'm not going to quote somebody from the Cato Institute, but rather from the New York Times, David Brooks, whom I suspect most of you know and respect. Avatar, he writes, is a racial fantasy par excellence. The hero is a white former Marine who is adrift in his civilization. He ends up working with a giant corporation and flies through space to help plunder the environment of a pristine planet and displace its peace-loving natives. The white guy notices that the peace-loving natives are much cooler than the greedy corporate tools and the bloodthirsty U.S. military types he came over with. He goes to live with the natives, and in short order, he is the most awesome member of their tribe. He has sex with their hottest babe. He learns to jump through the jungle and ride horses. It turns out that he's even got more guts and athletic prowess than they do. He flies the big red bird that no one in generations has been able to master. Along the way, he has his consciousness raised. The natives help the white guy discover that he, too, has a deep and tranquil soul. Okay, Simone, start us. Does this film have racist undertones? I think it, it was is very formulaic. We had all of the trappings of um, of 
uh, a story about race, the civilizing mission, the noble savage, a white guilt. But um, I think, well, I, let me just give you an example. So I think there were two um, parts of the movie where the same character, the kind of Colonel Blackwater character, said we're going to blow a crater um, that's going to wipe out their racial memory. And then uh, there's another scene where he asks Jake Sully, he says to him, how does it feel to have betrayed your race? So I think specifically the film was about race. And, uh, but I think we should see, I, I want us to make just different films about race that ask us uh, better questions about it. And I think that this was a lost opportunity in that sense. Jeff, racist undertones in the picture? Well, I, it's, ooh, I, but yeah, but again, so far under that uh, you really have to reach down to, I think, come up with anything yeah. solid. I think that, you know, and Jordan may be able to speak to this. I mean, it, the mythology reaches back to captivity narratives, right, which is basically about the turning mm -hmm. of the white settler who becomes either captured by or escapes to the indigenous people, the natives, and that experience. And I mean, the interesting thing about this is everybody's talking about dances with wolves. Okay, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. But there was a whole tradition of these movies in the 1950s. In the early in the 1970s, Richard Harris made a career out of making movies like Man in the Wilderness and A Man Called Man Horse. Called Horse yeah. They were all about that. I mean, this is something, it's also something, and, and again, you know, I would raise the point that if, if, if Cameron really wants, and I think as Michael says, I don't think this is a conscious attempt to be simplistic. I think probably sitting at home with nobody telling him otherwise, James Cameron's thinking, this was one hell of a movie. <laughs> <laughs> this is one hell of a, I think he's really thinking that. But I think that, you know, if you want to make a movie about race, you know, I think Simone's just, make a movie about race, deal with race. I mean, what we're looking at is this kind of idealization, a mashup of racial characteristics, dealing with yeah. hundreds of years of mythology, which again, is a safe way of not dealing with the issue of race. It's or, a movie about the idea of race. Uh, the idea of race, exactly. That's not yeah. the same thing. Yeah. Plus, it's not exactly clear which race is on the right side. They're blue. You know, so, well, yeah, it's species, <laughs> not race so that's <laughs> worth pointing out but you know because they're noble savages they aren't real they're they're figments of the imagination and so the whole movie is a figment of the imagination and I suppose that's okay because it is a movie but I don't really think it's about race so well sorry. Peter pigments of the imagination they have a I mean they have tails I mean the, I think that it's it's overtly racist um, but it's yeah. but it's disguised as a sort of an attempt at a sort of um, attack on colonialization but it itself mm. is just fa just falls into all of the all of the cliches about colonialism you're a Buddhist so, so. right mm -hmm. yeah. yes uh, the non-Judeo-Christian religious aspect <coughs> of the Navi people if I can put it that way does right. that add to their racial stereotyping uh, yes, uh, especially the way they dance. Uh, no, it's, uh, it's, um, it, it's astonishing. And, and it's, it's even more astonishing when you actually try and work out what the religion is. Because it's, again, it's, it's, a, it's a worship of a form of the internet. It's this, it's this notion that somehow, that, that it's not just that everything is all interconnected, Buddhists are quite happy with that, but that it's really easy to be, join the interconnection by just plugging in. And if you can plug in, you become immediately part of nature. That's part of the, the, the magical power of it, and it's part of the, the, the way in which it talks about film. And that's not how human beings are, have to deal with nature. It's, it's not all that non-Judeo-Christian. I mean, there's really? paradise. Mm -hmm. There's a tree in the middle of paradise. There is the idea that uh, paradise is a desired state that can be broken. No there snake on the tree, though. Mind you, they've got Adam and Eve, so... That, that's right, they have, that's right, yeah. they have, that's right. That's they not have. specifically Christian. It's not quintessentially Christian. I didn't Christian. say it was yeah. specifically there Christian. There are many myths that have that as mm -hmm. part of... You know, part of this is also the decline of the Soviet Union, in that our enemies were always very easy. They were Russian, and they dressed in a certain way. You had to find new bad guys. Interesting, mm -hmm. if you notice, they make sure there are lots of black soldiers at the mm -hmm. end when they're being rounded mm -hmm. up. Now, mm -hmm. there, there are many black men in... in in, um, in the American Army, but they made a point of that. Who are the new bad guys? And there's a great deal of confusion in Hollywood. It used to be very easy, now it isn't. <laughs> it's actually quite self-loathing. The people who are the bad guys are us. Oh my golly, what do we do? I don't know, we embrace some Eastern religion, and, and we, we say we like environmentalism, and we make a movie like this and make lots of money, and everyone is content. Simone, you want to come back at that? <clears throat> I just didn't want to get away from the question of race. And I think uh, one of the things I wanted, like a movie that is so explicitly about race, how it is in our contemporary moment when we think we're in a post-racial society, that race can be evacuated, that we can say this is really not, uh, not about race when it is. And I just want to, to the audience really to demand to go to, to make movies and to go to movies where it doesn't take um, someone to come in and save you from your, for, your, for yourself. You know, it's like, what does it mean when a, an oppressor comes to, someone comes to your planet ex explicitly to oppress you and ends up saving you? And I think we could just ask better questions and make better films and demand them. Well, let me follow up on that with Jeff then. Why, why is it that we are still making in the year 2010 movies that are apparently extremely popular 
that have got the white guy riding in on the horse to save a bunch of people who are not white. Well, I think it's, again, I think it's 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 the safest bet. It is the safest narrative. Because the audience I think you can is all white. Yes, you can still reasonably presume that if the audience is not all literally white, then they have a sensibility that is white when it comes to watching popular entertainment. Yeah. Um, exactly. So therefore, the easiest thing, the easiest point, the the the, the, the safest assumption, uh, 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 the safest assumption you can make about widest audience appeal is by sending the heroic white guy in, and you give him a set of flaws, and you give him something to redeem himself and something to overcome and an awakening of consciousness and that is the easiest story to tell hmm. and this is part of the thing which is I think absolutely fundamental to Avatar's appeal apart from the technology is it tells mm. the easiest story possible well yeah but Simone l let me follow up with this isn't Natiri I mean she's really the hero in this movie isn't she in which case is it not as formulaic as everybody around this table seems to say it is but I think if we equate the mammy into the formula, then it's still, it's, it's still this, this racialized woman. We can imagine Zoe Saldana as a Latina, black Latina woman, who then helps this white character, um, Jake Sully, to become who he is, that he gets that. I think she could have flown that pterodactyl thing. She didn't have to explain it to him. <laughs> so I don't necessarily think she was the hero. That actually and, um, makes it sexist. By the way, not Women are very bad drivers of dinosaurs. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Here we go. Exactly. So, so yeah. So I think so. But I mean, I guess there are more serious questions that we can ask about race um, outside of this film. But that we're talking about it. I mean, we always need to be talking about these things. Uh, that's what I think makes the film important. That we can actually have these discussions. So, why do you what do you think it's going to take to move beyond this kind of stereotypical Hollywood storyline that, that Jeff says is just so easy and, and we don't seem to be able to get beyond? Uh, I guess funding other um, other types of directors and stories to get into film school, to taking a chance on um, on certain types of scripts, and maybe putting more money into um, uh, independent film. Yeah, that that will never happen. happen. There, that there will never happen. No. Never these, happen. Well, no, because there these stories are these stories maybe are so Pandora. basic. You know, there's going to be <laughs> well, yeah, maybe yeah, we there's going to be a, a a small audience for intellectually complex and sophisticated films, and there's going to be a exactly. whopping audience for stories that extract their themes from basic mythological narratives and that is never going to change I, so I, I, don't, I don't agree. There, there are challenging movies that do well it depends on the quality of mm -hmm. the movie and there are all sorts of yeah. movies that take a, a very different analysis of contemporary society and they either go to their bad movies uh, we've just elected a man well, we haven't but they have down there uh, to the white house largely based on mythology ask most people who voted for barack obama not a white man as far as i know what does he represent? What does he stand for? What are his policies? They have no idea, but the mythology is he will solve all of our problems. So pe can, people can be simplistic and facile beyond the movie industry. <laughs> of course. <laughs> okay, let me, we're coming into the home stretch here, and let's uh, do our final chapter here, which we're calling More Than Entertainment? Question mark. From the Boston Globe, Avatar is merely the latest white man's romance, and it hits every stop in the playbook. The broken hero who finds renewal by leaving his decadent people who joins a tribe of noble savages and purify, becomes purified, who leads his new children to victory because they can't lead themselves, and becomes a legend in the doing. Tarzan has been here, and Herman Melville, and so has Kevin Costner. As a cultural cliché, it reflects profound disgust with the society of men and a yearning for authenticity, for a connection deeper than anything our fallen modern world can provide. Michael Korn, is he onto something here? I think we pretty much said what, what he uh, has, uh, has, has written in this piece. Uh, there is a danger, though. We're all sitting here uh, on TV, smugly saying it's such a bad movie, and millions of people, millions of people went to see this movie, and their lives weren't changed, but they, they were slightly happy at the end of it. And I feel rather, rather mean criticizing it in such a way. Yes, it, it isn't a good movie. Pretty much everything about it, almost every aspect, is weak. Even the acting is not particularly good. Some good actors in this movie, but they didn't act well in the particular movie. But why did it do so very well? If we could turn this into a formula and give it to every other director and producer, here it is, make the movie, you know they would do it. You mentioned earlier Cameron laughing all the way to the bank. He does have something. He had it with Titanic as well. Mm -hmm. I wanted the thing and to Terminator. sink. I was bored, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, Terminator, I thought, was a good movie. I thought, actually, Terminator was something was. different. Mm -hmm. but it, he went wrong afterwards, but he's still doing very well, and, and I don't quite understand why. Uh, Jordan, is there something, does the movie tap into something I don't know. Maybe there's a kind of a um, well, the idea a of lack of uh, a, a lack of satisfaction with the with the absence of spirituality in our lives. Maybe something like that. Well, and there is this dissociation from the renewing element of nature. I mean, most people are urban, so they romanticize nature, and it's understandable to some degree because you can't even see the stars in the city, and no, and that's a lack. But the problem is, is the movie is 
too simplified. And so it gives people the wrong idea in a sense because it fails to remind them that they should be grateful that they have a roof over their head, you know, mm -hmm. even though that house happens to be built on a patch of nature. Simone, does it tap into a kind of a, a dissatisfaction with modern life, the lack of spirituality in our modern lives? I don't know if it's the lack of spirituality, but maybe for some people, the lack of um, space and home. And one of the interesting things that I think that came out of the film was uh, in February, a group of Palestinian protesters dressed up as Navi um, to, hmm. to protest the building of, um, I guess, uh, walls uh, outside of Ramallah. And that got some news play. And if for some, if for maybe like a, a short moment, some people who wouldn't necessarily know about their, their conditions or really care could could empathize for a minute because they're dressed up as like as Navi. I think that maybe is something where this kind of uh, avatar uh, gets put into reality for you know repurposed for political uh, protests. I think that's well. That's let's good. follow up on that. You've touched on something there. P I mean, Peter, the the reality is, this may be just a silly motion picture that apparently not too many mm -hmm. people around this table like, but the fact is that a century long, almost century long conflict in the Middle East. One faction in that conflict decided it would be a good idea to dress up as characters from this motion picture in order to gain some attention for their cause. He has crossed over into something here, has he not? Yes, and, and uh, I, think it's a, I think it's deeply problematic. It, uh, again, mm -hmm. if, if you're the Navi, it suggests that you're primitive and that you don't understand that bows and arrows won't work against tanks. Well, mm -hmm. there are certainly there are victims and there are deep, pro deep problems, but it, 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 the, thing, the, the way to deal with the issue is not in this kind of childish way. I'm not saying that Palestinians are childish. I'm saying that James Cameron's version of this is, is childish. And we have a Canadian example. Two days ago in Variety, it was a full page ad um, called, it's got, called Avatar Sands. And it was signed <laughs> by 25 environmental groups and a number of First Nations about how James Cameron's Avatar should win the best uh, Oscar because we have here in, 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 in the world, we have our own Pandora um, unobtainium, which is, the, which is the oil sands. And people have signed on to this. Mm. And I think they should have thought about it a bit more before they signed on to it. And the reason why they did it is because it's a battle about images, that the human beings are now in such control over the planet that reality doesn't matter, really. The real nature is not very interesting. What's really interesting is who's in charge of the images, because the images will eventually control the natural world. And so, and so that's why they want to have FaceTime yeah. with Avatar. So these people dress up in blue, and, and people sign on with pictures about well, Avatar so they can control how the images are going to be handled. Okay, because Michael. reality is so less interesting. What's very interesting about what happened outside Ramallah is that part of the contemporary Palestinian narrative is <clears throat> there's been a westernization of the area. Uh, it's relatively new. So in the past 30 years, Palestinian groups have said, not even Americanization, but you've westernized what is, it may be less advanced and less sophisticated, but was something different. And it, it's mm -hmm. not about anti-Semitism, but part of this, the, the, the Western Jewish influence has been to, to westernize. Yet they use what is a direct product of the worst of Western culture, a, a, a movie character, to demonstrate. Now that actually is, is pathetic in the real sense. It's terribly sad that Palestinians feel they have to do that. How self-defeating, but how very typical, I suppose, of the, of the modern age. Do you see the Palestinians as the Navi? Do you see that connection there? Well, I think that people always feel that they're the Navi when they're being invaded. I mean, mm -hmm. it's part of the invasion myth, right? It's like, well, we're the people who were the people, really, because most tribal names mean the people. And the force that's invading us is basically some version of dark and satanic, you know? So, and that's what happens in this movie. And it's can be dark Standard and story. <laughs> Okay, about six minutes to go here. Let me put a couple of more things on the table. Uh, Ray Salam, who's been on this program, he's with the New America Foundation, has written that James Cameron's avatar is an indictment of the kind of society that produces James Cameron's. <laughs> Are we being, okay, Simone, you first. Are we being a little too tough, a little too harsh on our own Western-oriented, Hollywood-loving, superficial civilization here? Not at all, and, and we're having fun doing it as well, too, so I think that's, I mean, that's important. Okay, Jeff? I, I don't think you can ever be too tough on stupidity. Um, I think the moment you let it go, you're in for big trouble. And I know there are all kinds of people out there who, I mean, probably people who are huge fans of them aren't paying attention to discussions like this. They're not even having discussions like this. They don't care about discussions like this, and that's fine. But the fact is, is that when you allow any form of popular color to popular culture to just kind of float out there without any discussion, without any kind of context, then I think that uh, um, uh, you, that, is a, uh, that is remiss. That is a form of irresponsibility. And I think that you, I just want to pick up something about the complexity of the Israeli-Palestinian <laughs> narrative, right? 
I can think of no more effective way of making that the complexity of that particular narrative simplistic than by imposing the Navi on it. Mm. And that's one of the reasons why movies like this work, because they offer simple solutions yeah, that's to why everything. They're propaganda. That's exactly, exactly. why they're simple propaganda. Simple solutions to everything that's complex. Yeah. And that's why a lot of people don't want to hear yeah. conversations like this. And you know, very mm. frequently when a political argument is taken to a simplistic level, you know, like it turns into a form of pathological propaganda. And that is a bad idea. You know, like the idea that civilization is evil and that nature is good. That's not a very that's not a very wise idea, you know. I mean, the average lifespan was, was probably doubled in the last hundred years, mm -hmm. and it might be useful to be grateful about that instead of being only incensed by it. Well, that's the question: Are we being too harsh on Western civilization in this in this? Picture? It's unbalanced. And, and who's, it's unbalanced. You know, I mean, civilization is terribly dangerous. There's absolutely no doubt about it. But freezing to death in a swamp is really dangerous too. So you know, you're always stuck because you're vulnerable. You're stuck with the necessity of balancing fatal powers and they can easily get unbalanced and that's kind of what this movie's about but you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Simone, uh, the camera didn't catch it but I did. You just had the most quizzical okay. look on your face. What was that all about? Uh, just about civilization and, and, and life rates. I mean that's really happening for not for everyone and for, even in the country I'm in now when we think about the disparity between um, black, white, uh, ways of living and, and life and access to health care. So I think that when we can bring questions like this to the fore around access, uh, even if the film allows us to think about political protests or allows us to think about our complicity with environmental degradation, I think it's, it's important in that way. Okay. Peter, how about you? So on talking this about year? civilization is good. Talking about civilization. <laughs> uh, Gandhi's famous quote, he was asked what, what he thought about Western civilization. Mm -hmm. He thought, you know, I think it would be a good idea. <laughs> he was a product of it. He wouldn't have been the man he is unless he had studied under British education. Part of his arrogance, by the way, was also part of his British education. <laughs> civilization, by its nature, what the word means, it, it, no, it is a very good thing. Uh, the, the, the problem with the movie is it doesn't begin the conversation in many ways, it ends the conversation. Uh, it says mm -hmm. nothing about environmentalism, it says nothing about race. So we're not provoked into thinking more and harder and it deeper. It says the conversation isn't worth having. Yeah, basically. that's right. It's yeah. done. It's finished. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And Churchill has the right rejoinder to that sort of attitude too, which Go is ahead. that, well, you know, democracy is a terrible form of government except for all the other forms. Yeah. And you can say the same thing about civilization. Is it, it terrible, obviously. It produces tanks and murderous robots and atom bombs and so forth. but. You know, it lets James Cameron make a $300 million movie about saving the planet. And, I was so, just, yeah, I just and lets David Suzuki fly all around the world in jumbo jets, too. <laughs> <laughs> and if, by, if, if by Western civilization we mean cowboys and Indians, I think it actually reflects pretty well on Western hmm. civilization. Okay, one last thing here. I want to ask, and uh, okay, I'll start with you, Jeff. You're the film critic here. How ticked off are you going to be Sunday night if at around probably, uh, I guess it'll be Monday morning, 12.06 a.m., Monday morning, James Cameron is walking up onto that stage with a golden statuette in his hand and telling everybody, guess what? I'm the king of the world again. Well, I'm a little too zen about that these days. <laughs> Whatever happens, happens. I've learned to accept it. It's no personal reflection on me. It doesn't necessarily mean the universe is spun out of control and I will not be watching. You won't be watching? No, no, no. I you don't. don't watch the Oscars? No, 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 no. It's, it's a lot easier to just take sleeping pills and lie down <laughs> on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How can a film critic not watch the Oscars? I mean, by caring you? about movies, Steve. Oh, we'll right. have this discussion some other okay. time. Do you know about Sacha from... Baron Cohen, by the way? He, he was going to appear dressed as an avatar saying he was carrying the love child of James Cameron. And Cameron, yeah. being the great egalitarian, said, if this happens, I'm walking. Oh, my goodness. Really, yeah. I hadn't heard that. Yeah. Simone, if he wins the best picture for this, are you going to be upset? Um, no, because I won't be watching it either. So um, I thought six billion people watch this thing every year, and I've got two people on this. <laughs> they program. all deny it, though. They all deny it. I'll be guess. watching. Without, yeah. I'll be looking at the moon. You're not going to watch it either. Give me a break. Well, how important do you think <laughs> the technological element of the movie is? I mean, that's relevant, right? I mean, sure. he did push the envelope in terms of what technology is capable of doing, it's and that's not it. worth mm -hmm. nothing. I mean, the plot, well, okay, and the characters were pretty simplistic, but the, the movie wasn't a catastrophic failure in all, in all regards. So, so if it wins it Best was, Picture, you're, you're okay with that? No. <laughs> I like The Herd Locker. I think it's a way better movie. Although, you did know? you read the piece in the paper today about that one? No. Oh, just that the kind of accuracy about how these guys did what they did is apparently soldiers are laughing as they watch yeah. that movie oh, because oh. it's so unrealistic mm -hmm. from what really happens. So, okay, it shows well, you what I know. You know what? No, it just gives you another reason not but to watch is, the no, Academy yeah. Awards on Sunday but night. But it is a movie. I would, I would recommend instead 
getting a video of Fern Gully. <laughs> yes, um, we know that's your fave. Yeah. Yeah. Pocahontas. Okay. Pocahontas. Dances with Wolves. <laughs> oh, Bambi. You know, films with real serious ecology. In okay. Them. Last word to Michael Corn mm -hmm. on whether he's going to be watching the Oscars Sunday night and whether he either hopes or doesn't hope that James Cameron goes home with a statue. Well, unlike these elitist snobs around here, <laughs> I will be watching because uh, it's quite fun. You sit there with popcorn or whatever and the shout at the kids. I will be watching. It, it may. Golly, the number of bad movies that have won. Uh, no, I, I, I'm not Zen. I don't even know what that is. But I'm like Jeff. But <laughs> I'll just sit there and, and you have another beer, and then it won't matter very much at all. But at least you're going to be watching. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Good on you. Can I thank all of our guests for participating in tonight's program? Starting with, shall I go out of town first? Simone Brown at the University thank of Texas know. Austin. Simone, uh, those of us uh, in Toronto. Um, send you greetings from uh, your old hometown and thanks for being on the program tonight. Nice to Thank have you. you. Jeff Pavier on the left hand side of the table along with Jordan Peterson from the Toronto Star and University of Toronto respectively. Michael Corrin uh, whose latest book is called As I See It. Thank you sir. Plug away, plug <laughs> away. And Peter Timmerman from York University. Good to have both of you on the program tonight as well.